Lecture 5, Concurrency Control Implementation. Now, in the previous concurrency course, yes, EC252, um, and the content that we just reviewed, we discussed at length the need for concurrency control constructs and why they are useful and what they do in terms of ensuring the correct execution of the user program. Um, in our introduction to the subject, we covered certain ideas about how concurrency control might actually be achieved. Uh, and we went over a number of solutions that did not work. Um, they were things like strict alternation, um, using flags to indicate whose turn is next, stuff like that. And we said it didn't work. They all failed for various reasons, usually because the resulting scheme at the end of it all did not actually provide mutual exclusion, so it was possible for two threads to end up in the critical section, um, or it uh, allowed more than one thread to be in, in there, um, or it um, did not actually work for some other reason, like it was vulnerable to deadlock or starvation, uh, and or in that sentence is inclusive or, so um, either one of those would be bad, and some of the solutions we talked about are actually in fact vulnerable to both. So, that's not right. Um, and um, well, now, I mean, we're not in Kansas anymore because you know, it was the operating systems course. So it's not enough to know just at a surface level, like how to use such concurrency control constructs. Now we have to know much deeper about how do they actually work. Now, one possible solution that could work in an embedded system uh, or uh, maybe just a very simple operating system is disabling interrupts. I would describe this as very crude, but it does get the job done. If there are no interrupts, then we don't have process switches as a result of hardware operations completing and no timer interrupt um, that triggers the operating system to schedule uh, a different thread to run, so it does maybe work. The problem with this solution is that it permits certain bad behavior. Right. Um, it does allow one thread to disable interrupts and then just never re-enable them. Um, that will allow this thread to guarantee that it can monopolize the CPU time, it can use as much as it wants, and other threads, like, what, what are they going to do? They'll die mad about it. Like, that's, that's all that they can do. Um, and there's you know, nothing else um, that anybody can do. Maybe a system administrator, but even then, how? The system is not responding to interrupts, so even if you were you know, typing in commands on the keyboard, like how would the system deal with those? So that's not great, and we definitely do not want that. Right? Um, maybe that thread actually doesn't intend to uh, leave interrupts disabled forever, it just forgets to enable them after disabling them. It exits early, uh, and the whole system is stuck, right? And if there's an emergency situation, the system can't respond to that either. And the system is supposed to, I don't know, detect fires or something, like that's not a problem. But even if everybody had good intentions and there were no programming errors and you know, it doesn't exit unintentionally before it's supposed to or whatever, it doesn't, it doesn't work, right? Although it's dangerous and, and somewhat effective, that holds true only for a single CPU system. It's pretty easy to establish a scenario where thread A executes on CPU 2 and thread B executes on CPU 5, uh, and each of them ends up in the critical section at the same time, uh, even if disabling interrupts happens because the threads just continue executing, and so that's, that's not a solution. So okay, well, what do, we do? what do we do? What do we talk about? Well, our solution that we came up with was the test and set instruction. Um, and the test and set instruction, as you will recall, is a special machine instruction that is performed in a single instruction cycle and is therefore not interruptible. It's an atomic read and write all in once. The idea is that test and set returns a Boolean value um, and when it runs, um, we will you know, see its behavior that sort of looks like this. And I emphasize once again for the like 15th time um, that uh, although it's written in vaguely C-like code, yeah, it's Boolean instead of bool, um, this is intended to be a precise language description of the, um, of the functionality of the hardware. This is not actually how it's implemented. Um, this is just for the sake of the example uh, to use fewer words than it would take to explain during uh, a text-based explanation. So 
it is atomic read and write, right? When run, it examines the flag variable, which I called i in the example, and if it's zero, it sets to one and returns true, otherwise it returns false. And the meaning of the return value is clear. If it's true, it is the current thread's turn to enter into the critical section. If it is false, it's not your turn, please wait. And once again, the test and set instructions are not actually implemented like that, but it is a useful explanation for our understanding. And because this is done in a single machine instruction, no matter how many CPUs are trying to execute the same test and set code um, concurrently, then only one of them will successfully change the value from zero to one. There is a certain amount of hardware magic around caches and cache coherence to make that work, but that's for another course. Any points for guessing which course it be? Yeah, of course, it's EC459. <laughs> the answer was obvious, right? If you didn't hear me uh, plug it enough times in EC252, uh, you will certainly hear me plug it a few more times this go around. Okay, and then of course, you know, giving you the tools um, is only a, a part of it, right? Um, and using it, here's an example of code that uses a test and set routine, uh, which is while not test and set busy, we wait for our turn, uh, and uh, we just wait in this while loop until such time as we successfully set the value from zero to one. Uh, and then when we are uh, done with our critical section, we set busy back to zero. Right, that allows the next spinning thread to continue. Uh, and you will notice that the assignment of busy is assigned zero there, doesn't use something like a test and clear instruction or similar. Uh, and if you wanted one, it would make sense, but you don't really need it. If only one thread is ever in the critical section at a time, then only that thread will be modifying this busy variable. Because the other accesses are atomic, they either fail or succeed in one step. And either the value is zero or one, it can't be somewhere in between, so this is grudgingly okay. This doesn't work for all scenarios. An analysis tool like Helgrind might call this out as a possible race condition, but maybe you don't want to do that um, just uh, as a normal practice. The other minus of this, of course, is it is a busy waiting kind of routine, uh, and maybe that's not what you want. Right? Um, we could make more efficient use of the CPU um, if we did something other than uh, than busy waiting, but this would work. However, right, um, there are additional limitations to this, um, and one of them is based around the idea of this zero or one nature of this particular um, test and set thing. Okay, um, so test and set does not work for the general or counting semaphore. Right? And we've worked with the mutex before and we've worked with the um, semaphore. And so we know that the semaphore could take an arbitrary value. Right? We talked about the Unix semaphore and the Unix semaphore is always a general accounting semaphore. Uh, and so when you wait on the semaphore, it decrements the value by one. Uh, and when you post on the semaphore, it increments the value uh, or signal, same thing. Um, and so the semaphore we know has an internal counter, even if you can't really check it by asking what its current state is. Okay, so yeah, I mean, this does work um, in terms of test and set for the uh, general, uh, for the uh, count, um, binary semaphore, but the counting semaphore, it does not. Uh, and for that, we have compare and swap. Uh, and So because the semaphore, you know, the general semaphore can have multiple values, test and set isn't going to be enough. What we actually want is called compare and swap, sometimes also called compare and exchange. Um, same thing, just two different names like post and signal. Uh, they are interchangeable. So if you use one, um, it means the same thing. It doesn't matter which one you use. Um, and like test and set, this is implemented uh, using an atomic hardware instruction and said instruction is completed in one cycle and therefore cannot be interrupted. Um, as before, it is not actually implemented like this, but a precise C-like explanation of it looks like this, um, which uh, we take a pointer to the value that we want to update, the old value, the new value. Uh, and if the value is equal to the old value, then assign the new value. Uh, and we return whatever the value is, whether it's the old value or the new one. Okay. 
Um, and so, again, I, I emphasize this is just a C-level um, definition of what it's like. It's a single atomic hardware instruction. Uh, and this is kind of um, more flexible, but also requires a little more care in its use. So if we wanted to make use of it in trying to decrement a semaphore, um, then we end up with something that looks a little bit like this. Um, so we'll say int old is assigned one, uh, and while true, we are trying to um, decrement the semaphore. We're trying to do compare and swap of the semaphore from old to old minus one. Uh, and if actual is equal to old, great, um, then we update the, uh, the value old is assigned old minus one. Uh, otherwise, old is assigned actual. Uh, and then if we did that, we successfully decremented the semaphore uh, and we may have to wait for our turn. As you know, when we decrement the semaphore, if the resulting value is negative, then we should not proceed and we should wait. Uh, and if the value is non-negative, so zero or a positive number, then we are able to proceed. Then we have the critical section. Uh, and we have similarly another uh, while true loop here with int actual as compare and swap uh, to old and old plus one. Uh, and if actual is equal to old, we're done. Uh, otherwise, we update our value for actual. Okay, um, so the compare and swap routine changes the integer value from the old value to the new value if it succeeds, and it makes no change if it did not succeed for whatever reason. Uh, and the reason why it may not succeed is if some other thread has modified the value in the meantime. That's why we get the actual value back from the return statement uh, of the function so that we can update the old value in the current thread. If we wanted to change it from, for example, one to zero and we find it's already zero, then we need to try again trying to change it from zero to negative one. That might also fail, but we will eventually succeed even if it takes an arbitrary amount of time. It might be possible uh, for a thread to be so unlucky that in a super busy system that it never gets a turn, but let's just say for the moment that that does not happen. Uh, and we could actually prevent that risk entirely if we use an alternative approach that we are going to talk about in a little bit. Another thing is, why do we guess that old is one in the beginning here? Right? We have no idea what its actual value is, so why, why did I just assume it is one? The answer is truthfully, it doesn't really matter. I mean, if we know what it is, it's efficient to remember it. And that's why we actually assign the value um, if we're gonna break out of the loop, because when we try to increment it, we're guessing effectively that maybe it won't change between now and then. And if so, our initial guess in the second while loop is correct, but maybe it's not correct and that's okay. Um, whatever our guess is, if it's right, proceed. If it's wrong, we'll get back the correct value and then we just try again. So that's okay, right? It wasn't a concern for the test and set approach because everybody's trying to change it from you know, zero to one or, or one to zero. Um, but this approach still relies on busy waiting where we're trying to uh, increment the value. But whether we use the atomic uh, approach or not, um, right, we end up sort of with this um, problem. And when I say the atomic approach, um, before we go into the problem, right, I mean, like, if there's appropriate hardware support, you can use a simpler version of this where you do an atomic increment or atomic decrement. That prevents the need for the loop and the possibility of, like, guessing the wrong value. Uh, and we talked about atomic operations also in the previous course. So maybe you've been looking at this and you've been thinking, why on earth would you use compare and swap uh, when you could just use uh, atomic increment and decrement? Uh, and to a certain extent, you would be correct. Um, but just make sure when you do this, you choose the correct atomic primitive that returns the new value since that determines whether the calling thread should get blocked or not. But on that subject, whether we use the atomic approach or compare and swap, there is this really big wait for our turn in the middle there. Well, how do we do that, right? That's covering up the fact that unlike the test and set approach, succeeding at compare and swap execution doesn't mean it's actually the current thread's turn, just that it successfully updated the counter value. We actually need to wait until we know for sure that this thread is actually permitted to proceed. Okay, but how do we wait for it? 
How do we? Terms and conditions apply. Okay. Um, well, that's the job of the operating system. Where we left things off in EC252, we said if we don't get the result that we want, the operating system blocks the thread. Okay. No real details were provided as to how that happens. Uh, there was a certain amount of like hand waving and uh, you know saying, all right, uh, this is just how it is. Um, that sort of uh, operating system does whatever it does. Magic, I mean, it was fine. Uh, and it was all we needed to know in terms of systems programming. Um, but we were just putting that problem off until later. The problem is that later is now. Right? We can't put that off anymore. Now it's our responsibility on the side of the operating system to actually make that happen. Okay, so I guess we better think about it, huh? All right, so you want to lock a mutex uh, or wait on a semaphore. Or I, I really should say, so a thread wants to um, lock a mutex or wait on a semaphore. Probably wasn't you since you are in this scenario of the operating system. Um, inside the system call, it uses one of the methods that we've talked about, right? Test and set, compare and swap, atomic operation, to try to figure out whether the thread can enter. What happens in the system call, um, and you know, maybe in the kernel code, um, we just need the result. It doesn't have to be in the kernel, but we have to report the result to the kernel so we understand whether we have to do something. Um, and if the caller used a try lock or try wait sort of approach, then actually the caller doesn't get blocked no matter the outcome. I mean, if they would have been blocked, um, we just send back a response from the system call that says no, typically a non-zero return value, uh, and maybe increment the counter again, depending on how the call to try wait worked. Then the implementation is done and you can actually skip the remainder of this section. Put your feet up and relax. Uh, the only problem is we actually have to know how to implement sort of the, the remaining part of it. Okay, so a thread wants to enter the critical section and is not able to because of the fact that you know, there's another thread already in the critical section. And we said, well, the operating system blocks the thread. Well, how do we do that? Uh, we talked about you know, thread state and process state and what have you previously and, and have reviewed that sort of material. So we know that we just need to assign the state, right? Um, yeah, blocking a thread from the point of view of the operating system is actually super easy, barely an inconvenience. Um, we just change the status of that thread to be blocked and we choose another thread that's ready to run. Now, how we choose the next thread again, we'll come back to in scheduling, um, but eventually we will get there. Okay, um, are we done? Problem is we're not, right? Like marking a thread as blocked on its own is insufficient because what are we waiting for? Right? We need a way of knowing that this thread is blocked on the particular semaphore or mutex it was accessing. Otherwise, like just knowing that a thread is blocked isn't sufficient. You know, it's like I tell you I need something, but I don't tell you what it is. Well, what are you gonna do? You, know, you bring up a whiteboard marker, is, you know, is that what I'm waiting for? No, that's not it, a whiteboard eraser, no, a pen, a cookie. Like, how would you know what I'm looking for? Well, we have to keep track of that, right? Um, and so what do we do? There's some implementation choices here. And I'm not gonna argue that any solution is you know, necessarily the absolute correct one, but we'll think about it, right? Um, maybe every concurrency control construct like the mutex or the semaphore has its own queue. Uh, and when a thread is waiting for that thing, you just put its PCB in that queue so that you know that this, um, this particular thread is blocked on this particular semaphore or this mutex, um, and that's enough. Um, or maybe when a thread is blocked, there's some place in its PCB and the, the main list that says what it's waiting for. Okay, either way, right, we need some mechanism for recording what a particular thread is waiting for. Otherwise, like it's, it's gonna be a problem, right? 
Um, and that's also necessary because eventually whatever did lock the mutex will want to unlock it uh, or a thread will post on a semaphore. Um, and if it's a counting semaphore, we always increase its internal counter and unblock uh, a thread if a thread is waiting. In a mutex, we only change the uh, internal counter from zero to one if there's no thread waiting. Otherwise, we just unblock a waiting thread. That particular implementation is not the only way to go about it, but it's consistent with what we talked about in EC252. Um, but it's important not to set the mutex back to unlocked and forget about whatever threads are waiting, or worse, set it back to unlock and unblock one of the threads. Um, either of those would ruin the mutual exclusion behavior that we want. So it is very important that our implementation does what it is supposed to do. Uh, and you know, we are very careful about uh, when do we unblock a thread and when do we not and when do we change the internal value. Uh, it is important not to treat uh, a mutex just like a counting semaphore because we don't always want that. And that prompts immediately the question of if we are unblocking a thread, which one? Right. What thread should be unblocked when an unlock or post event occurs? That's a scheduling decision. Scheduling is another one of those topics um, that we hand waved away in the past and we said, okay, the scheduler just does whatever and you have to pretend that the scheduler is your enemy trying to ruin your day and make you sad. Um, and that's not strictly true, um, but we hand waved it away, but it's also something that we are about to find ourselves forced to revisit from the perspective of implementing it. So um, that's uh, another one of those things that we will be uh, spending significant time on later on. So it is a scheduling decision uh, as for which thread is going to be unblocked next. You have choices um, and a very simple approach is just first come first served, right? Uh, you just take the first thread that is in the queue. It's the one that has been waiting the longest. Uh, and that is the one that gets unblocked when uh, it is time to unblock a thread. Is that optimal? Well, I mean, the slide says it may not be optimal, but why might that not be optimal? I mean, one reason is it ignores certain things like thread priorities, right? How important is this thread, you know, first come, first serve, ignoring the priorities? is fair in some sense, but maybe not ideal in uh, the grand scheme of things. We'll come back to this uh, a little bit later on. Now, the first come first serve approach does prevent the possibility of starvation as each thread will eventually get a turn to run. All right. A more advanced system maybe should consider thread priorities, but maybe cannot be based solely on thread priority because that does introduce the risk of starvation the other way, um, where threads with lower priorities never get a chance to enter into the critical section. A really advanced system could even consider things like whether deadlock is possible or more likely, depending on where the resource is assigned. And we talked about some deadlock detection uh, and prevention kind of uh, algorithms in the past. Most systems don't do that, right? Just keep in mind, like even commercial operating systems don't do it. So even the, the simple approach uh, of just ignore the possibility of deadlock does appear to be sort of the most uh, most popular one. With that said, um, a thread that is ready to run again is just marked as ready to run, so it's so unblocked, um, its state is changed, uh, and at this point it is a scheduling decision as to which thread continues execution. But we knew all of that from doing this from the application developer's point of view. Um, and when a thread is unblocked after waiting for the mutex or semaphore, it resumes its execution at the return of the system call and will proceed as expected. It doesn't really notice the difference. It doesn't know that it was uh, necessarily suspended. Uh, it just uh, called wait on the um, semaphore uh, and its execution doesn't continue until it actually gets uh, to proceed. Uh, and then it proceeds from that state. 
Uh, whereas you, know, uh, you as a person, right, if you go to Service Ontario or something and you have to wait in line, like you know that you're in line and you can notice the experience of being in line. Uh, and moreover, there may be like a designated waiting area. You know, if you take a number and you have to sit and wait for your number to be called, whatever. But the application doesn't really, doesn't notice that and it doesn't know that. Um, it just tries to proceed and it is able to continue. So in that extent, it's a little bit like it is, um, you know, put to sleep, right? Like you walk into the service Ontario uh, and you would like to go up to the counter, but it's, it's currently busy and you just magically fall asleep um, until it is your turn. Uh, and so you don't notice the waiting time. To you, it seems instant, right? Some actual wall clock time may have passed, um, but as far as you're concerned, um, you didn't have to sit down, you didn't have to wait, you didn't have to take a number. So actually it might seem maybe even a little bit pleasant. So maybe that was a little bit easier uh, than uh, we were expecting to actually implement this sort of behavior for um, semaphore and for mutex. It does require careful accounting and does uh, have pretty bad consequences if we get it wrong, but just blocking and unblocking the threads isn't conceptually super difficult. And then there are the reader's writer's locks. And as you know, the reader's writer's lock allow for multiple read threads to execute concurrently, but only one writer. And when the writer is in the critical section, no readers. We built up the concept of the reader's writer's problem in the previous course using just basic semaphore mutex constructs, but it's probably more efficient to have a self-contained construct that meets the goal. I mean, we learned about how the, uh, we could implement the mutex and the semaphore. And you could just use those and just sort of copy and paste those implementations into the reader's writer lock, but that's probably not the most efficient way. So how do we do it? Well, the problem that we face is it's not exactly like the counting semaphore, is it? Right? A simple counter is probably insufficient. Why is that? Yeah, if the counter is currently one, does that one represent one reader thread or one writer thread? Okay, we don't know. So we should have two counters, yeah? One reader counter, one writer counter, and then you could keep track of them in that way. Okay, I mean, things get interesting depending on whether you care about writer priority. Let's say that we don't care about priority for writers. So if a writer wants to enter and there's either a writer or n readers, the writer is blocked, otherwise it can proceed. If a reader wants to enter and there's a writer, then the reader is blocked. But if there are other readers, then there's no issue and it can continue without any delay. Okay, so what do we do? Well, if we go through the two counter approach, um, where we say, okay, there's a reader's counter and a writer's counter, we still have this kind of headache, which says, well, if the reader's count is seven, is that because there are seven readers currently in the room? Or is it seven readers that are waiting to enter? It's hard to know, right? We're gonna need some more accounting. We're gonna need a different way of thinking about this to make sure that we actually you know, let the threads into the room at the right time. And I mean, we could build this up by having, okay, like here's the counter of the number of waiting and here's the counter of the number of the room, but maybe that's overdoing it. Maybe we can come up with a simpler approach. We talked about the light bulb analogy as a way of understanding the reader's writer's lock. We said if there's um, anybody in the room, you know, the light switch is on, that sort of thing. Um, the last person to leave the room turns out the light. We use the light switch as our analogy and maybe there's something to that here. So here's an idea. We have a Boolean variable that says whether the lights are on. Then a counter can be keep, uh, used to keep track of the number of readers currently in the room. Um, and the reader's writer's lock can have associated cues for um, both readers and writers. So, okay, this is kind of interesting, right? Um, if the light is on and the reader's count is non-zero, that maybe suggests that readers are in the room. Um, if the light is off, um, is it because readers are waiting? Maybe. 
Okay, so let's go through the workflow for the readers uh, and let's continue. So if a reader wants to enter the room, it tries to change the light switch from zero to one with a test and set instruction. If this thread succeeds, it's the first reader and may proceed, increment the reader counter, and will not get blocked. If the thread fails, maybe there's a writer in the room? Well, the way to know that would be to consider the state of the reader counter. If the counter is zero, there's a writer, then the reader should get blocked. Otherwise, increment the counter of readers and proceed without being blocked. So even if the reader fails at setting a light switch from zero to one, Part of the reason why it may fail is that the lights are already on because there's another reader in the room. Uh, and if that's the case, then we don't get blocked. We can just proceed. So let's keep going. When the reader is done, decrement the count of readers. If the reader count falls to zero, unblock a writer if one is waiting. Otherwise, set the light switch to zero. Okay, that seems like a manageable workflow to implement. What about a writer? If a writer wants to enter the room, try to change the light switch from zero to one. If the writer succeeds, it can proceed. Otherwise, block the writer. Okay, um, right? When, when a writer is, uh, is trying to enter, the only situation in which it fails is because there are readers or another writer ahead of it. Uh, and that means we get blocked unconditionally uh, if the lights are already on. When the writer is done, um, unblock either uh, all of the waiting readers or uh, one writer. It is important to note that you have to unblock all of the readers because um, any number of them might be waiting at the time that the writer has finished and wants to exit from the critical section. Um, but there's, you know, there's nothing super complicated about that. But that opens up immediately the question of can you prioritize writers in this situation? Yeah, it's very easy. Um, when we are unblocking a thread uh, after, say, the writer has finished, prefer to unblock writers over readers. Just just choose them more often than we would choose the other threads, or you know, all the time, really. There is potentially a little bit of risk of starvation uh, if we always prioritize writers. That might be a problem, but realistically, it is unlikely to be a big problem. Uh, just because of the fact that readers writers locks um, are used mostly in scenarios where writes are less common than reads so it is not super likely to happen in practice but it could happen in practice uh, and for this reason right we would prefer maybe something that doesn't always choose writers but we can certainly prioritize them in this scheme so yes writers always choose writers in the end uh, even if there is sort of a little bit of um, risk of starvation Okay, um, but the thing that we actually wanted, right? Um, and when we talked about giving a uh, writer priority in the um, previous course implementation, it wasn't just, oh, hey, when a writer is finished, it unblocks another writer. What we actually said was um, when a writer is waiting, no new readers are allowed to enter the room. Because although we can solve this problem of um, you know, writes being delayed quite a bit uh, by choosing to unblock writers when we're choosing to unblock something, it doesn't actually solve the problem that we talked about earlier, um, which said, well, what if there is a constant stream of readers, they are continuously arriving, and there's never a pause where there's no readers in the room, so a writer gets delayed indefinitely. So let's fix that. How do we have the behavior that when a writer is waiting, no new readers are allowed to enter to the room? Now, the important thing to remember here is that reality can sort of be whatever you want, right? Um, when a reader wants to enter the room, take a look at the state of the waiting queue for writers. And if there is one, even if we would normally let the reader proceed, just block the reader thread. That doesn't sound nice, right? Under normal circumstances, uh, a reader should be able to enter when there are other readers in there, but you don't have to let them. Now is not a good time. And that's part of sort of the, the joy of being the implementer of this is that you can choose this um, and you can say, 
Um, what you want to do here is block readers because, well, a writer is waiting, so we're going to block the readers so that the writer gets to proceed, and when the writer is finished, it can then unblock those waiting readers. Why not? Okay. Um, there's a couple of things to note, though, about it. Um, things have become a little bit complicated because the logic that we are discussing here requires us to try to change the light switch and also maybe modify the counter and then decide based on that whether a thread should get blocked or unblocked. Um, and that's not atomic, right? Um, you can use test and set uh, and it's an atomic instruction, but looking at that result and then deciding what to do um, is two separate operations. So we have to be a little bit careful about it. It might make sense to use a mutex internally before modifying, say, flag and counter variables. Uh, just don't forget to unlock the mutex internally before blocking a thread. Um, and in the previous course, we discussed the implementation of a reader's writer spin lock. Uh, and we said it looks kind of like this, right? There's a counter, um, and counter keeps track of um, read threads, and flag indicates um, whether it's uh, available or not. One indicates available, uh, and zero is in use. Uh, and using these two concepts, it's possible to keep track of readers and writers in such a system, even though it didn't give priority to one side or the other. Um, this kind of gives, I would say, pretty strong evidence that it validates this idea of how to implement the reader's writer's lock. At least the implementation we've discussed is plausible. In this case, flag being one indicates the lights are off and flag being zero means the lights are on. This, like the side of the road that we drive on, is one of those choices where you could go with either convention and it would be fine. It's not what I would choose. And in fact, it's not what I did choose in the earlier examples, but it doesn't mean this thing is wrong. And the final concurrency control construct implementation we'll talk about is the condition variable. And condition variables have a lot of similarities to things that we've talked about, um, but their semantics are different. Two things that really highlight this, there is the possibility of the lost wake up problem, but also that the condition variable is always paired with mutex. So when a thread waits on a condition variable, it must be holding a mutex that is previously acquired to call the wait function. Uh, and this releases the mutex or unblocks some thread that was waiting for it, but the current thread always gets blocked unconditionally, no pun intended, and will be waiting in the condition variables queue, right? So when we have a call here, there's no decision. We will definitely uh, unlock or reassign the mutex and we will block the calling thread. If a thread signals on a condition variable, if any one thread is waiting, it's removed from the blocked queue of the condition variable, but it goes into the blocked queue for the mutex, right? Um, and uh, the same applies for the uh, broadcast operation of a thread broadcast on the condition variable, all the threads that are waiting in the condition variable queue are moved to the queue for the mutex. They don't just immediately get unblocked, and that's kind of important to note, right? Um, whether it's one thread or many waiting on the condition to be fulfilled doesn't mean that they all immediately start executing. In fact, that would be bad. Um, that would have all sorts of threads um, in the critical section at the same time, and that's not what's supposed to happen. Um, so unblocking them really just makes them wait for the mutex, um, and that's okay. Um, it's maybe somewhat counterintuitive, but it is um, sensible under the circumstances. Um, so you'll notice that there's kind of no manipulation in the discussion here of any sort of internal counter. When we talk about you know, waiting for the thread, well, they just get blocked uh, on the condition variable. And, um, every time uh, in the broadcast or signal, we wake up uh, multiple or one thread, depending. And that's kind of it. There's no counter. There's no need for one. Right? In a condition variable scenario, if no thread is waiting when the signal or broadcast takes place, then no thread gets woken up. That does lead to the lost wake up problem where sometimes you know, a thread that was expecting the signal doesn't get it because things happen in the wrong order or uh, you, know, you get there too late and you miss the thing that you were looking for. And that can happen, but lost wake up problems are like part of the specification, right? Um, this is how the description of a conditional variable works. And there's no reason it's um, supposed to work any other way. So it is part of the spec, right? Um, condition variables are not just semaphore with broadcast. 
you might not want the lost wake up problem that might be an issue and in the code that you write you, you maybe don't choose to use condition variables because uh, you are worried about the lost wake up problem but maybe it's not an issue for you so maybe you're fine with it um, and if that's the case you choose the correct thing but as the operating system designer you need to implement these because they're part of the spec they are an important part of it and you know you understand how they work um, even if you know that they're only used in you know, rare scenarios but it's important to remember that um, the semantics of the uh, conditioned variable are not just semaphore with broadcast even though broadcast is kind of a big um, component of it um, in many ways it would actually be wrong to have an internal counter right um, in a semaphore um, the call to post you know, increments the counter and the thread that calls wait doesn't get blocked um, so when we break it down we can't actually use the semaphore as the basis for uh, the condition variable, it's it's just not going to work, right? Um, keeping track of the counter and everything would be unnecessary uh, and also would, would lead us to the wrong answers because it would say, oh, we should block this thread when we shouldn't or we should not block this thread when we should. Um, so we can't just say, okay, the, the condition variable is some sort of wrapper around um, a semaphore. But why would you want to, right? This implementation is simpler all considered right there, there's no need to you know, set the value and check it and make a decision based on any of that as a condition wait always blocks the calling thread uh, and signal or broadcasts will unblock one or more threads and you know, move them to the waiting queue for the mutex and that's it so it's much simpler why would you want to change it anyway this concludes um, our discussion about the concurrency control constructs uh, and uh, soon we'll go over to our next topic which takes us into the next unit of the course, which is about memory. <laughs>